Um, so again, hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar. Um, my name is Carrie Mokowski. I am the National Program Senior Manager here at FAIR, and I will be your moderator for today's presentation. So um, we are so, just a couple of housekeeping things actually before I move on and, and welcome these two women today. Um, this presentation is going to be recorded and it's going to be posted on our website in about seven to ten days. So please note that for maintaining a quality recording, all attendees are going to be muted throughout the webinar. However, if you're having any kind of technical difficulties, um, you can use the chat feature on the right-hand side of your GoToWebinar toolbar. Also, because this webinar is primarily just a really informal question and answer type um, setup, please feel free to ask away, ask um, questions throughout the webinar. Um, hopefully we'll have time to get to everyone's question or at least address um, the general topic. Um, so please feel free to engage and interact um, with our two speakers. So let me move on. Um, on the next slide, you will see I am delighted to um, introduce today's presenters. Um, we have both Allison Davin and Anna Mascala. And I probably butchered those last names. Which I, <laughs> but, um, I think first up we'll have Allison. And if you can just introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Anyone anyway, go to the next slide? Yeah. I'm yeah. Allison Davin. I'm a senior at the Catholic University of America. And one more slide. There it is. <laughs> um, I have a lot of food allergies, allergic to milk, eggs, beef, peanuts, lamb, sesame, carrots, strawberries, and tree nuts. And yes, I can only say it in that order. Um, I have asthma and seasonal allergies. I was diagnosed at 10 months old, so it's been my whole life and I've been like this. So almost 22 years as of Monday. Um, I work as a marketing intern for dining services on campus after I had a really bad allergic reaction my freshman year. They ended up hiring me. Um, as insight for dietary restrictions that they can use in the campus dining facilities, but I also do marketing work for them. I did study abroad in Rome last spring, and I was there for four months, and I actually survived. I did not die any terrible allergic reaction death, which was great. <laughs> and I also have a blog called Allergy Alley, which I started my sophomore year of high school for my Girl Scout Gold, uh, Girl Scout Silver Award that I still use today and I actually have an Instagram account for it. And my little brother also has all the same food allergies as me, except he's not allergic to carrots, which he loves to brag about. <laughs> so that's just a little bit about me. Anna, you wanna go? Sure. So my name is Anna Masiola. I graduated in May, 2019 from the University of Arizona with a Bachelor of Science in Nursing. I am allergic to eggs, milk, chicken, turkey, peanuts, and tree nuts, and I have asthma and eosinophilic esophagitis to top it all off. Um, I currently work as an RN on a pediatric intensive care unit, which is a very rewarding job. Um, this past summer, I worked as a camp nurse in Wisconsin with um, children with food allergies, so that was also really rewarding. I, part of my honors thesis, I educate schools in Tucson about how to handle food allergies in the school setting and how to work an epinephrine auto injector. Um, I lived at home during school and when I was in college, I directed several spring break service trips with other UA students to cities around the country and I really learned how to manage my food allergies through those experiences. So a little fun fact about Anna and I, we actually have been presenting with FAIR for, this is our third year doing it, where we've spoken at the Teen Summit, um, speaking about colleges and food allergies. So it's kind of the same thing. You guys just don't have to travel anywhere to do it this time. <laughs> yeah, we actually met in 2017 in the one in California. And ever yep. since then, we've been really great friends. We have... Yeah gone to I visited her home in New Jersey we went to New York we've yes. had like three years of amazing friendship yeah well that's awesome thank you guys for those introductions and I will agree I've actually seen you both present at the summit and you did a fantastic job so we're so grateful to have <laughs> thank you, you. With us today um, Thank what you. we did is we actually, yeah, you're very welcome. When we um, were promoting this webinar, we asked for some questions in advance. So I think we'll start with some of them if that's okay with you too. And feel free to sure. chime in whenever. 
the, these first couple may be um, directed more towards you, Allison, because I know, Anna, that you stayed at home for college. But we, of course, had a lot of questions come in about the whole roommate situation. Right. And, you know, what do you do? Like, did you have a roommate with food allergies? You know, if you did, how did you kind of handle food preparation and eating in your dorm room? And if you didn't, maybe you had a single room. Like, are there any best practices or tips, um, you know, that you could give to, you know, rising seniors that are about to head off to college? So I think, first of all, it all really depends on what you're comfortable with. So I did live in um, a roommate style dorm. So I had a roommate and we shared a bathroom with two other people on the other side of the bathroom. So I was interacting with these three girls every single day. Um, I am not touch sensitive for my food allergies, which is great because it wasn't a problem having the allergens in the room as long as I wasn't eating them or it didn't end up on like my side of the room, like any open containers or anything. But I was very upfront about it in the beginning when I agreed to room with this my freshman year roommate um, and she was great about it. I, all I did was said, Hey, I just want to let you know, I have severe food allergies, so I'm going to be doing things a little bit differently. I'm going to have my own food sometimes. Um, and she, the first question she asked was, do I need to not have things in the room that will make you sick? Like, do I need to avoid anything? And for me, it wasn't a problem. I remember I jokingly told her, Nope, you're fine. As long as you don't spread peanut butter on my bed, we'll be good. Um, and it worked out really well. I did not have my own kitchen freshman year. I did eat in the dining hall, um, which was a little bit of a struggle. We had a community kitchen where I got accommodations that we had a full size fridge and freezer in that community kitchen. And in the freezer, I put my own plastic tub that I labeled Allison Davin food allergies. And I would put things that I went grocery shopping for in there. Um, especially if I had a really bad allergic reaction my freshman year, there was like two weeks where I had a little bit too much anxiety to even go back to the food court. Um, so I made my own food for two weeks and it wasn't ever an issue for me. But I think the biggest tip I can give is just communication. If you don't tell your roommate that there's a problem, they're not going to know. Um, and that's on any situation. It's not just food allergies, really. So it's important to be able to stand up for yourself and stand up for what you need to be comfortable and to feel safe in your own living situation. I actually live in a five person apartment now on campus. I'm actually sitting in my kitchen right now at our little kitchen counter. Um, so I can make most of my own food now, but my roommates and I, we all share food um, or we all share the kitchen, I should say, and we all share dishes. And my roommates were so nervous about making sure I was safe that they we're like quizzing each other on what I'm allergic to. And then they put up a little sign on our fridge that's like in pretty calligraphy that says all my food allergies. And people come over and be like, why do you have a list of food on the, on the fridge? And it's my food allergies, so they don't forget. And if there's ever anything they want to reference, they know it's right there. And I've trained them all how to use the EpiPen. Um, I have an OBQ, so they all know how to use it. Um, so that's one of the first things I did my freshman year. I was like, hey, just so you know, this is where I keep my Benadryl. This is where I keep my OBQ. This is what to do in an emergency if I can't do it myself, which actually was fortuitive that I did that because I ended up needing someone to find my Benadryl for me because it was not on me when I had that allergic reaction freshman year and they brought it to me. So again, communication, like that's like the thing I think I'll emphasize the most today is communication is like the biggest thing going into college, both with your peers and with people in the school that work for dining services or anything like that. Awesome. Wonderful. And we will definitely get into more of those communication based questions. Um, but can I back up one minute? Cause I just had a thought and I was wondering, cause we hear this a lot at fair, um, you know, when you guys were back in high school thinking about where to go off to college, you know, was food allergies and your food allergies really part of that decision making process? You know, did you how much was that part of your decision of like whether or not you were going to go to a specific school or university? Um, and I guess we'll start with Anna. You both feel free to answer. Yeah. So for me, when I was looking at colleges, um, I, of course, was had all the factors that any normal 
you know, normal high schooler has, like, you know, you go for scholarships, you go for whatever your major is and, and whether, you know, they have a good program for that. For me, I didn't want allergies to hold me back because, you know, I have these allergies, they're a part of me, but I can't live life, you know, holding back because I have these allergies. So I went to college being like, you know, I'm going to make whatever I need to do. I'm going to make it work. You know, I'm going to go for what I'm passionate about, what I am passionate about for my career, rather than figuring out whether or not they can, you know, uh, help me with my allergies or not. You know, I wanted that independence and, you know, to take on the world without having, you know, to hold back because of, you know, allergies. So I went for the career. Um, Allison, what do you what do you have to say on that? I completely agree. So when I was applying to schools and visiting schools, like every time we did a college visit, we would, if we could, we would email ahead and say, hey, I have food allergies. Can I meet with somebody that works in the kitchen just to like walk around? And if that, no one can meet with us, we would just walk around the dining halls. Um, and we saw some really great, like innovative ways to handle dietary restrictions. But I like my talked to my parents about this a lot when I was applying. But my mom always said to me, you know what, no matter where you choose to go, they're going to have to feed you. Like they're going, we're going to figure out something. We're going to make it work. Whether that's you in like a not freshman dorm where you have a kitchen, you're going to do that. But if you can be in a freshman dorm and they feed you, that was like the ideal opportunity. But you know, you're coming to college for your education. You're not like, mm -hmm. and to like meet new people and have new experiences. And I just hate the idea of like having to restrict where you want to go because one kitchen is better than the other. So I'm right with Anna. Like I chose the school based off of the architecture programs and not my food allergies and we made it work. Yeah. I always say, you know, just because we have food allergies doesn't mean we should be, uh, we should have opportunities taken away from us. We should, mm -hmm. we have the same opportunities as everyone else. And just because we have allergies doesn't mean we should hold back on our careers or anything that we want to do in our lives. Retweet. I online. agree with that. <laughs> yeah. Here, <laughs> here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. So kind of like following that journey, then maybe when you had some schools picked out in mind that were for other reasons outside of your food allergies, you know, what are some questions about, you know, the food service or the dining services? What are some questions that you guys asked um, when you were going on your tours or you were doing that initial research? That's a tough question. That's four years ago. Anna, that's like five years ago for you. <laughs> I know, it's crazy. Um, I think that the biggest thing was asking them right off the bat, how do you handle food allergies? Like without giving any explanation, like you want to hear what they do without any prompting to like understand. Um, I know for me, I didn't get super in depth until I accepted my offer to go to Catholic University. Um, and they assure, like they we were in contact since like May, right? School didn't start till the end of August. We emailed a bunch. They seemed super on top of everything. And I was like, this is going to be great. It's going to be super easy. And my, my mom and I felt super comfortable, which is saying something. I feel like if your mom is like, yes, this is going to work. Like moms get it, right? I show up for orientation and they have like a food tent that they're catering for orientation the first four days of school. And the only option they had was like a gluten-free section. And I was like, um, I'm not gluten-free. Like I, I'm everything but gluten-free. <laughs> and I remember we sat down with the like people in charge of dining on our campus and we're like, what the heck? <laughs> you said that you could do this and you clearly are not prepared. And they were not prepared for orientation, but they were a little bit better prepared for the dining hall itself. So orientation, I ate like eight Subway sandwiches probably just to like get through the weekend, bunch of snacks. Um, I think another good question to ask is how they separate food in the food court, like division of food. Like as most schools have buffet style, how far apart is each dish? How easy is it for things to get cross contaminated? What is the procedure for like changing gloves between each person ordering something? Things like that. Um, but you would think of like going to a restaurant. It's like the same thing, except now you're paying a lot more money and you got to make sure they do what's right. 
Anna, any thoughts? For me, yeah, when I was applying, once I just like figured out what school I wanted to go to, I was curious on like education on allergies. So when I went, U of A had a, like a food court style um, kind of, it wasn't really a cafeteria, it was basically a food court. And so, but they had, you know, union services with who was in charge of all the, mm-hmm. all the restaurants. And so my questions were like, are they educating their staff on food allergies? You know, are they aware if I ask them to change their gloves, are they, you know, going to understand and going to do it and take precautions for me? Um, my, like ingredients lists was a big one. Like I wanted to know what was in things, um, where could I get ingredients lists if I, you know, wanted them. I designated places on campus that I felt safe eating at and I kept the ingredients list close to me. But of course, like you can't always stick with those same places. Like say you want to go out with friends and friends go to other places. Like I wanted to know what I could have and, and how, you know, the staff would help me eat safe. Good. Awesome. Thank you. And so I know you kind of addressed this a little bit, but, and you both have um, allergies that fall outside of the the standard, you know, top eight, um, and that there were buffets and other eating situations. But, like, did you find that the college and schools were pretty accommodating, you know, to you having allergies that weren't part of the top eight? Yeah, I think that in general, there's still a lot of education going out there about food allergies. So most people assume it's the top eight, but once you start to explain, it's a little bit better, Um, which I think goes to back to like what another good question to ask is, if something goes wrong, who do I talk to? Um, Because I had phone numbers of all the people that were in charge that like, hey, this person isn't changing their gloves or I didn't feel comfortable ordering this today because this happened. I could text somebody. Or I could just walk downstairs to the office and be like, this just happened. Um, especially once I started working there, it was really easy because I really knew everybody. But right off the bat, just like make sure you have someone to contact with. But when you like explain your food allergies, you have to explain. Like every time I order food, I say, hi, I have severe food allergies. Can you cook me a piece of grilled chicken on the allergen-free pan over there? And I watch them change their gloves. I watch them wash the pan. Because it's like the second that they like that you're not watching, that it's likely something's gonna happen. So it's good to, especially if it's prepared in front of you, do your best to like pay attention, especially at first, until at least you know the person behind the counter. Like now I go up, I'm like, hey Sheila, what's up? Can I have a piece of grilled chicken? And she's like, yeah, I'm gonna go change my gloves. So it's totally depending on your comfortable comfortability level, as long again as you communicate, these are my food allergies. No, it's not gluten. No, it's not just dairy. I need you to cook. I need you to cook my piece of chicken off the grill because I'm also allergic to that beef that you have there. It's not just the grilled cheese. Like again, communication. Yeah. What's funny about Allison and I is we have opposite meat allergies. So she can have chicken and turkey, and I'm very allergic to chicken and turkey. But I can have beef, and she's very allergic to beef. So we, you know, we have different meat allergies in that sense. So for me, it's chicken because. I haven't met too many people who's allergic to chicken. And then every time I, you know, say, oh, I'm allergic to chicken and turkey, they're like, oh, that's interesting. I've never heard that. Mm -hmm. Um, And so uh, for me, it's just like if I want a hamburger from somewhere, I need to make sure like the chicken wasn't the grilled chicken (laughs) that they're also serving is not cooked on the same, you know, uh, stove or, or the same grill. And uh, same thing with like cheeseburgers, um, because in the place where I work, like in the cafeteria, they have hamburgers and cheeseburgers, but it's all in the same spot. And so I have to go up and make sure that I'm like, hey, I have food allergies. I'm allergic to the chicken and the cheese that you're serving. Can you please do it on this separate grill that's like behind the desk, you know, a couple steps down? And um, usually they're really sweet about it and they do it. So um, it's really all about advocating for yourself. Wonderful. Thank you. And I know you're both stressing how important communication is, and even if you have to be on repeat. Um, can you let us know who, like, who did you initially, initially, excuse me, um, search out when you wanted to begin that conversation or begin those communications? Did you reach out to, you know, maybe it was someone in dining services or disability services, or was there like that main point of contact for each of you? Um I remember my mom calling a bunch of different phone numbers and then each referring her to somebody else. 
until we finally got a student employee who actually works in the same office that I work in now. She also, um, when she worked there, she had like a gluten intolerance. So she's like, oh, call this person in disability support services. They're gonna tell you who to talk to. They're gonna make sure you have all the right forms. So I actually have an accommodation form that says if I have an allergic reaction, I might not be able to finish my homework right away and I might need a five day extension. So I have like up to five days to finish homework if I have an allergic reaction. Um, that I give to my professors at the beginning of every semester. Um, but then we also directly reached out to the director of dining on my campus to get a direct point of contact within dining as well. So it's, you gotta reach out to both, I would say. Yeah, for me, it was um, for my professors. If we were doing anything food related, really, I, I went up to them and really emphasized my allergies. Um, and then I initially I went to um, nutrition services like there was a nutritionist on campus and so I talked to them and I also talked to the student union um, you know, group and talked to them about my allergies and and where are the best places for me to eat. I also Wonderful. went to housing. I also went to housing. I have a housing accommodation. So everyone else has to go through a lottery to get um, which dorm they get to live in on campus. I get to skip that and I get accommodations to choose my room first. So that way I have access to the proper kitchen that I need. Just as a side note. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's important. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so let's move a little bit away from food service. I had um, an attendee today ask a question and she said, um, she just let us know that she has a son who's going away to college in the fall of 2020. Um, he's allergic to dairy, eggs, and all nuts, and she was really interested in, Allison, kind of maybe hearing about your trip to Rome and how you went about eating safely, you know, for that long period of time away from home, you know, especially when maybe there's a language barrier, um, you know, or yeah. cross contamination. <laughs> and then, Anna, as well, if you've had any experience traveling and, and anything you'd both like to share. We can start with Allison. So... Rome, when I applied to study abroad, I put in my application and additional comments, I have food allergies, I'm going to need accommodations. And right away, they reached out to me and said, hey, like the glo it's the global services office on my campus. They reached out, reached out to me and said, look, we've accommodated food allergies. We have a campus in Rome. So we have a kitchen, we have a dining staff, um, but we've never accommodated as many food allergies as you. So let's figure this out together. Um, and I... I think over the course of like six months, there were like 60, 70 emails between me, the global services office at CUA, and then the two um, student directors at the Rome campus. So we like were on top of it. And we also had a few video conferences with them as well. So I think there was two or three of those. Um, but what I ended up doing to feel safe because they were worried about cross-contamination in their regular kitchen, is they wanted to give me an apartment on the campus, but we shared the campus with another school and they left at the end of January and we arrived at the beginning of January. So that apartment wasn't going to be available and it was a faculty apartment until the end of January. So I had like a month where I had didn't have my own cooking abilities, right? So they said, okay, for this first month, instead of having, informing the staff about your allergies, instead of like, trying to get them to learn, we're going to hire a personal chef for you. So for the first month I had this, basically she was my little Italian grandma and she was so cute and she did not speak English. So we had to have a translator between us, which was the student director. Um, but she cooked my food for the first month of school. Um, and I only had two minor, so I had, <laughs> the first day I showed up, I had an allergic reaction to literally a piece of bread and turkey, like a deli a slice of turkey. And it wasn't bad, but I did have like terrible stomach problems. Um, and I remember like crying. I was like, I just want to go home. Like I just got here and I already want to go home. Um, but I decided like stick it out and it was well worth it because like everything that I learned there was like well worth that like few hours that I was in pain. Um, but it was because 
we guessed that um, the turkey wasn't sliced on a clean slicer or the bread actually had dairy in it. Um, so after that, we used all like fresh meat basically. So I got to watch her cook one day and she brings in like a whole chicken, like it's already dead, but she's like cutting it up in front of me, which was a lot to watch. Let me tell you, that was a little gory, <laughs> but it was, she like wanted to make me safe. And after that first month, I got to cook all my own food. And what's great, what great resource is Google Translate has picture translations. So I could hold up the app, like my camera to an ingredient list and it would translate in the, like in the photo, um, like live, what everything was. And I also learned in advance what my allergens were in Italian. And I had a little card that said, I have severe food allergies. I'm allergic to these things to make sure that it was never, was never a problem. I never ate out at restaurants because I just didn't want to risk it. And there was, there's way too many cross contamination occurrences in America for me where I can speak the language. So like throwing in a language barrier, it just wasn't something I wanted to do. So I'd still go out to dinner with my friends, but I would order a glass of wine and I would watch the meat and I'd go back and eat some pasta that I made myself because I was able to find a bunch of safe brands. And once I found like a few recipes that I could make again and again, um, I was fine. So I think that the best thing to do is if you can get access to cooking your own food while you're uh, studying abroad or traveling anywhere, that's a really great option. Like even if you're traveling for a weekend, try and get an Airbnb with a kitchen kind of thing. It's way easier. And even when I traveled to different places, like for weekend trips while in Rome, I cooked my own food ahead of time and brought it with me in Tupperwares. So really a kitchen is like the power move for studying abroad. And I know you did some traveling for like student service trips. What did you end up doing for those? Yeah, so I went to, um, I did a program called Honors Alternative Spring Break in college. And it was basically a program that took a group of students to a different city, still in the US, um, but a different city to do like service work and humanitarian work. Um, and so I ended up going to call Denver, Colorado, my first, my sophomore year and my, Houston, Texas, my junior year. And those experiences, I really worked with our advisor in talking about, you know, bringing my own food, bringing snacks. When we would get there, we would stay either like at a church or at someone's house. And so we had a kitchen readily available and we would go grocery shopping beforehand. Um, and so through grocery shopping, I kind of was able to get my own ingredients and, mm -hmm. and talk to the advisor about, okay, like one night, everyone will have grilled cheese, but I think I'll, I'll make pasta that night. And they were like, okay, yeah, go for it. And so, you know, even if we would go out, I would prepackage my lunches or dinners and bring them with me just so I didn't have to order or I didn't have to worry about an allergic reaction um, mm -hmm. happening on the trip. And so actually when my junior year, when I was in Houston, Texas, I, one night we wanted to do like a Tex-Mex kind of experience. And so we go to this restaurant and I had my, I think I brought like tacos that night to be, you know, have the same cuisine. <laughs> and, um, and so I go in there and it was, the trip was actually like a week after my birthday. And I was in uh, school at the time and I didn't, I mean, I kind of, I didn't think I really celebrated my birthday. And so my advisor was like, okay, you know, we got to do a birthday celebration for Anna. This is going to be great. And so we tell, uh, my advisor tells the waiter and I had told the waiter, you know, beforehand, like I have allergies, I have my own food. And I think I got like chips and salsa or something. And so I told them about them and it was a very loud restaurant. There were lots of people, lots of music going on. And I guess their celebration was to, uh, you know, put whipped cream on their faces, like whoever's birthday it is, was like put whipped cream on their face and put a pie on their face. And Yikes. so, yeah. <laughs> and so um, I go and my advisor's like, okay, great. It's going to be a birthday celebration. Fantastic. And so I'm eating my tacos and out of complete nowhere, I like a bunch of people come up and just like put whipped cream all over my face. And I was like, oh my gosh, like what is happening? You know, it got in my mouth. It was like a big deal. And so I go in the bathroom and wash it all off. And of course, like my face turned into, you know, very plump um, was <laughs> my face. 
And so I kind of, and you know, I kind of had an allergic reaction. It was pretty mild for what it was, um, but it was very scary. And everyone on the trip was also super supportive. And, um, you know, we got some Benadryl and, and did the whole thing, but that was kind of a scary experience. So um, it, that was the kind of out of ordinary. Um, it was a very, mm. like, but I don't, you know, a weird one. And so as long as you're really prepared and, and you know, you advocate for yourself, it, it, uh, that it should be good. Make sure you tell your friends that you're traveling with where you keep yeah. your iPad and where you keep your Benadryl, what to do if you can't do it, because you never want to like be in an airport or like be in the middle of nowhere, or, like some random Italian restaurant and like not have the resources to help you because you forgot to tell your friends what to do. Right. So always advocate for yourself and communication is huge. And don't be afraid to talk to people about your allergies. I always like to say that, you know, you really are educating people based on being yourself, like just talking to people about allergies and saying like, these are really serious. Like, you know, that this is what I have to do in case this happens. I can't eat these things. You know, they're learning and they're being aware of what food allergies are. So if they meet someone else with allergies in the future, they're going to remember you and remember, oh, she couldn't have this and this was very serious. So I'm going to make sure to be careful with my new friend. As another story, one of our friends that we've spoken with before at other fair events, I think she's listening right now. Hi, Julia. She Shout traveled. Out to Julia. Woo! She <laughs> traveled to, I think it was China for two weeks, and she struggled a lot with eating out at restaurants with everybody else. And I, she, I remember her telling us that she just ate a lot of rice. Like find, like yeah. find something that you can eat and like stay consistent with it. Like once you know something's safe, do your best to like stay with like the safe few things that you can do because otherwise it just gets a little bit harder. Like it's okay if you're eating the same thing for four months when you're in Rome because you're in Rome, like embrace like everything else in your life that's going on because it's such a great time and you can learn so many different things that like your food allergies don't even matter. They're irrelevant when you're doing something so important in your life. Wonderful. Thank you both. Those are great stories and such great advice just from your own life experience. Um, and kind of just, I don't know, I've been thinking like, Anna, just kind of for you, because I know now you're graduated, you're in your new apartment. Like <laughs> what has like communication and advocating for yourself at the workplace been like? And Allison, you're headed there soon. But have you noticed like you kind of are using some of the same skills that you had when you were in college to now kind of be an advocate for yourself, you know, now that you're in the real world out there working? Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's an adjustment for sure. I'm uh, adulting as, you know, <laughs> as I say. Um, as the kids say. <laughs> as the kids say. <laughs> adulting fairly well, I would say. Um, and it's kind of the same experience really telling people about food allergies. It doesn't always come up, but you know, when we're all sitting in the break room and I'm eating, you know, something that seems so simple, um, they ask about things or, or people bring things all the time. Like people, we get like one night we got free, um, was it free tacos or free something? And I didn't want to go down and get it because I didn't want to risk, you know, cross contamination. And so people are wondering. So then I tell them and it's kind of the same conversations, you know, I always have where, you know, you tell them and they say, oh, that's, you know, so interesting. And, and um, it's really the same as advocating for yourself. You always want to make sure you're aware of what's going on. If there's things like in the break room that you don't know where they've been made or what they are and everything, like, of course, don't touch them. And so, um, yeah, it's again, advocating for yourself, kind of the same situation. There hasn't really been any huge change that I've had. I work in an office um, where it's just me and my boss. Um, and it's like, the, the professional dynamic of explaining food allergies is like slightly different, like like coworker to coworker versus like you to your boss. Like it's a little bit awkward. They're like, especially because yeah. it's just the two of us in the office. I'm like, okay, I have to explain this to him, but like, it's still kind of weird. But again, if you don't tell somebody, they're not going to know and they're not going to be able to help you. Mm -hmm. So Again, lesson for the day, communication is key. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's also, you want to make sure, you know, your coworkers always know where your EpiPen is, where your Benadryl is, you know, where those things are. So in case anything does happen, they're aware and they know, because of course you don't want to be in that situation where right. you know, no one knows what to do or no one knows what's happening. And, you know, which I feel no, like we can good. recognize, I think Ann and I can both recognize that like, Showing people in your workplace where your iPad is, is like so, so much harder than like showing a friend or like even a stranger mm -hmm. that's your peer 
because no one talks about like their health in the workplace. Like no one wants to talk about their medical needs. So it's like kind of awkward, but again, if you don't do it, no one's going to know. Exactly. And it's different because like for me, I work on a hospital unit where, you know, I they don't know what food allergies work. are. Well, that's true. You know, that's a perk. <laughs> I live in, a, uh, I work in a place that, you know, you ideally want to be if something bad ha does happen. So I guess I got that going for me. Um, and so, uh, but I don't always work with the same people all the time. Like, you know, it changes all the time. So, you know, it's kind of hard. I can't just like huddle everyone together and be like, okay, guys, this is, this is me. There's just two, there's, it just doesn't work like that. And so just kind of, you know, as you bond with people, as you, you tell people, you know, showing them this is where it is. And you might have to do it a couple of times. Like you might have to do it over and over and over again, but it's important for your safety. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, when you guys were talking a little bit before about traveling or kind of throughout the presentation so far, we, um, you know, about so much about preparing your own food as much as you can. And we just had a parent ask a question, you know, that this, hasn't always been, you know, that easy for her son or something. And that there are times, you know, when you just don't, you can't, you can't prepare your own food, you know? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so what do you do in, in those situations? I mean, are you packing things that maybe you don't have to cook? Are you just not eating? I mean, are there like any tips or advice that you have when you really don't have a chance to prepare your own food? I've done both, like just not eating or bringing a snack. I remember one day in Rome, I completely overslept and we were supposed to leave at 12 and I woke up at like 11.55 because I was up late working the night before and people were like knocking on my door like, you ready to go? And I was like, oh my God, I don't have time to make any food and I was supposed to make a bunch of food this morning because we were leaving the campus to go see a play and like eat lunch with these people that were going to make lunch for us and I had nothing prepared. So I was like, well, we're just going to go for it. And I left, I like got dressed and I left and I like didn't eat that day until probably 8 PM just because I didn't have any snacks on me and I didn't have anything prepared. But I was like, look, I could stay home and eat three meals today. Or I can like go see a bunch of Catholic seminarians put on Shakespeare the fifth and watch them eat tacos and hang out with them. And that's what I did. And it was a great day. Was that's I amazing. starving? I was so hungry, but it was so worth it because sometimes you had to make those little sacrifices. Like, yeah, our life can be a little bit harder than the average person sometimes. Um, but the sacrifices to like maintain that normal lifestyle, I feel like is so important because your food allergies are like a secondary aspect of who you are, even though they're a primary aspect of your health. Retweet. That was a good one. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so for me, um, kind of what Allison said you know sometimes you just if you don't have food re readily available you just kind of don't eat and um, sometimes that just feels safe because this happens a lot like when I go out to eat sometimes or if like you know I don't want to miss out on social events I, I consider myself a pretty social person so I <laughs> you know want to I want to go out and be with friends and I want to go out and do things but sometimes they want to go somewhere that I am just not comfortable eating and there are days when I'm just like you know when I go to this restaurant, it's a lot of stress for me to have to talk to the waiter or waitress and, and make sure they understand the severity of this and make sure that, you know, I, I have a dish that's safe and, and doesn't have any cross contamination. And so sometimes I go and I, you know, I, I, I bring maybe a snack or I just don't eat and have like a lemonade or have something like fruit or something like that. Um, sometimes, you know, you, the food that you plan is not going to be there, kind of like Allison's story. There was one night I was on night shift and um, I was planning, you know, that day was crazy and I didn't, wasn't able to pack my lunch. And I was planning on going to the cafeteria to get a salad because I've designated the salad bar to be a pretty safe place. And I, you know, I talked to the guy and I've made a connection with the guy, but for some reason that night, the cafeteria was closed for whatever reason. And so I was like, okay, well now I got to go 12 hours without eating anything. And so I was able to go, to like a, a little tiny restaurant that uh, has like snacks and stuff. So I went down there and got like a, a thing of hummus and chips or something like that, at least something. And so sometimes you just don't eat and you, you make do with what you have. Um, but it's always important to try and plan and really always advocate for yourself because your health takes priority. And bringing that back to college life, 
I feel like for me, having a meal plan and getting to eat in the cafeteria was so important because I feel like you can recognize that so many friendships are made over a shared meal. Like so many times, like you walk, you can walk into the school cafeteria, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior by yourself, find somebody, you know, and sit down and hang out. So it was so important for me to make sure that like, I really did not want to have my own kitchen to be making all my own meals my freshman year, because I knew that one cooking would be time consuming. And two, I would be missing out on all these meal times where like people that I'm not in classes with that I want to be friends with are all hanging out and I wouldn't have been let into the cafeteria right so I I like made that a priority because you're still a freshman in college like you still want to meet people and like make new friends so I think it's so important to be able to share a meal together even if that meal is you sitting there with a glass of water like you still get to hang out with them and then you get to educate them like yeah I'm not eating because of this and then they know and then more people are aware about food allergies. So it all like comes around in a positive. Mm -hmm. The thing about our society too, and in at least in America, is we're very food driven. Like a lot of things that, you know, like we'll go out on, if you want to go out on a date with someone, it's, oh, let's go out and get tacos or let's go out and get food or a group of- She really likes tacos, tacos. everybody. <laughs> I really do like tacos. I'm very much craving tacos. I need to make that happen soon. Um, and, but it's- <laughs> Um, you know, people like to go get pizza on a Friday night or whatever. And so, you know, we got to almost kind of adjust ourselves to, to, you know, not limit ourselves. We can't miss out on these. Again, we can't miss out on these opportunities because we have these food allergies. And so, yeah. Make other opportunities. If you don't feel comfortable eating with people, make other opportunities to go, like, let's go mm -hmm. ice skating or like once you're 21, like, let's go to a bar, like things that like you can feel safe about like make that happen. Like you can be the organizer of the friend group, you know? Mm -hmm. I've gone mini golfing on a date once. We like, you know, there are so many things that you can do that are not food related, you know, with a group of friends. Yeah. So not yet. Oh, okay. Awesome. Thank you. And you bring up a really hot topic and something that we've actually just got a bunch of questions on dating. So, um, <laughs> I knew that was, as soon hear... as Anna said that, I was like, there it comes. Uh, yeah, she, that's that trigger <laughs> word. She, you, you brought it up, Anna. So, um, <laughs> yeah. How do you guys, I mean, handle that or anything you want to share about that, you know, in regards to like bringing up your allergies when you're dating? Um, yeah, just anything you want to share. Allison, so Anna, tell me story. <laughs> Anna and I talk about dating with food allergies, I feel like, all the time to each other. Um, oh, yeah. But, so my now ex-boyfriend, our first date, we like, he wanted to take me to, out to eat and we were going to go to a movie and he already knew I had food allergies, right? I had already explained it to him. I think over text, like, I think we were talking about food and I was like, oh yeah, by the way, I have food allergies. And I explained that like, I can't eat a lot. So when I go out to eat, I eat a bowl of salad. And I can't have carrots, so I don't want them cooking anything on the cutting board. So I just get a bowl of lettuce. Anna is holding back <laughs> laughter right now. So I get a bowl of lettuce, like plain, with oil and vinegar. And like, that's what I eat at restaurants because it's, it's simple and I know it's safe. Um, so this first date, we, we picked this restaurant because as an architecture major, I think it's really architecturally beautiful. So I was like, I wanna go to this restaurant because I like the way it looks. Um, and he ordered with me a bowl of lettuce so it was like we both order can i have a salad with just lettuce and oil and vinegar i have severe food allergies and this waiter looked at us like we were insane he was like are you serious and we're like yeah yeah we are but what's important to know is that that was like yeah it was out of solidarity and it was cute but also, if you want to be able to kiss somebody at the end of the night, you can't eat my food allergies. So it was like this whole thing where I'm like, oh, well, he definitely wants to kiss me at night because he just didn't order any food. And now we're both going to be starving the rest of the night when we go to this movie, um, which we were. We, we went and stopped at the 7-Eleven and got snacks <laughs> on the way to the movie. Um, because like, but like, it's a something something that I've said before and I'll say it again is that if someone who's interested in you 
makes your food allergies a primary concern of theirs, then like they care, like they actually care. Whereas if someone does something that like blatantly ignores your food allergies or they like don't understand or they don't want to understand, do you really want them in your life? No, like th that would be a terrible person <laughs> to have as a partner. Like they should be understanding and accepting of everything about you, including your food allergies. So it was like cute that this guy went and had salad with me and suffered in silence with me over how hungry we were. And yeah, we got some weird looks from the waiter, but we had a great time. So who cares? Um, and I think that's the important thing. But to get to that point, to be able to have just lettuce with the person that you're going on dates with, you need to be able to talk about, like you need to have that conversation. And I've done it a few times now where I've had to tell guys I'm interested in, hey, I have food allergies. Um, so if you want to kiss me, you can't eat anything for like two to three hours and you also have to brush your teeth, <laughs> which is like the most awkward conversation ever. So I feel like a lot of times if I'm like texting the person and like food comes up and I know that we're like actually interested in each other and there is a potential for kissing to happen. I like drop it over text because then they don't have to process it all at once in person. You can like write out everything that you need them to understand in a cute little text and then they have it forever so they can go back and reference it. Um, that's my solution most of the time, but I, but I have dropped it in person before, but again, it's still awkward. Um, but if they make the effort to like take care of you, that's what a good, partner should do in a relationship boyfriend or girlfriend like I don't know I had a guy once this is like my terror story I had a guy once that I liked kiss me out of nowhere after just eating Taco Bell and I pulled back and I was like you just ate food I'm allergic to you can't kiss me and he was like oh and then didn't check up on me the rest of the night like didn't like do anything to follow up to make sure I was okay. Fortunately, nothing happened. Like I had no reaction because it was literally like one second before I was like, what the heck are you doing to me? Um, but obviously that person like shouldn't stick around because they didn't care. They didn't check up. Like they didn't make sure you were okay. Like they, sh you should be a priority of theirs. And rant number one, Anna. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, for me, I did not have you know, I didn't eat salad, eat just lettuce with someone, but I did have, you know, my now ex-boyfriend was very, very good about my allergies. Um, you know, was very good about, you know, making sure that he was brushing his teeth and, you know, I can't be around eggs that are cooking in a kitchen. So, you know, he made sure like eggs weren't being made when I was there, or if they were that like, I was, I had something to do and like went out and did something. Um, and so for me, like, as far as introducing myself to someone, I, um, I, I tend to be pretty blunt <laughs> with my allergies. I'm it like, happens. You know, it's easier it to be does. blunt. <laughs> it is. It is. Um, and you know, I'm like, okay, so I'm allergic to all these things. And typically like in all the guys that I've met, it's usually like <laughs> when I'm with other friends or, you know, we're eating something anyway. So the topic comes up anyway. And so I bring it up. It and always like, comes up. <laughs> it always comes up. And like, you know, we always say like, oh, you know, maybe you don't like, don't bring up your allergies like on the first date it always comes up like <laughs> oh, yes. it always is something and it's always of course like I use it as my fun fact about me myself <laughs> I'm like I'm like when I'm trying to get to know someone I'm like okay what's a fun fact about you and then they're like okay it's this and I'm like well I'm allergic to a bunch of stuff and then it's a great icebreaker really <laughs> um, <laughs> that's what we keep telling ourselves anyway it's, you know, I'm hoping we try to convince ourselves. Way. Yeah, exactly. You know, we got that going for us. We're both um, single right now, so maybe it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe not. But you know, hopefully in the future. <laughs> um, um, but for me, it's always like I want to be proud of my allergies because to me, like, what's the point of not being proud of them? You know, it's something that makes us unique, and you know, like it, it's something that some people always remember you know, these food allergies. And so uh, as long as they are very, um, very cautious with my, me and my allergies and my food, and like Allison said, if they genuinely care, you want that kind of person in your life. If they don't care, or if they're like, 
oh, you have these allergies, but they're not showing through their actions that they really do care, then you also don't, you don't want that person. Like it's like an extra qualifying factor. Like you're easily able to like narrow people out because they don't care. Yeah, it's a great filter system, really. <laughs> like it really it's like a built in. It's a built in filter system. You know, you don't want to waste your time with those kind of people. It's true. You know, you're on to greater heights, my friend. And if you don't feel comfortable doing food on first dates, first dates with like sit down dinners for first dates are always awkward. Like it's always so much awkward. easier to go and do something like go bowling, like go ice skating, mm -hmm. go for a hike, like moving around yeah. and like not having to stare and make eye contact with a stranger or like someone that you have a crush on for yep. over an hour is yep. so much easier than like actually having to do that. Mm -hmm. So then you can avoid food in general. And if you haven't brought up with them, walking or like talking while you're doing activity is so much more lighthearted than like over a meal that like could kill you. <laughs> exactly. Wonderful. Thank you both. And thank you for your candor. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks a lot. That was a um, lot of information that we just dumped on you guys. <laughs> Right. It was great and super helpful to, you know, so many, you know, teenagers who are about to be going off into college and dating or already are dating, you know, or afterwards. So thank you. Um, I do want to address just kind of a topic because we've gotten a bunch of questions and I know we're, we're coming close to time. Um, so we had a few questions come in just about emergency response in general. Um, and if like either of you had any advice for, you know, the best way to like how to carry your medic, your medicine and have you ever worn any kind of medical alert jewelry, just like, you know, while you're around campus, if there's any, you know, best practices or what you all did. I don't know if the video is working, but I'm wearing my medical alert right now. <laughs> all my food allergies don't actually fit on it, but I have most of them. So I have a medical alert. I had one growing up, but I like didn't have one in high school because at that point, everybody and their mother knew who I was because I had two older sisters. It's like everybody just knew already. Um, and it was just, when I got to college, I was like, look, I'm now gonna be surrounded by a bunch of strangers. And if I ever like am unconscious and no one knows what's going on, if EMTs show up, they're gonna need to know. Like it's, so I highly recommend having a medic alert. That's my personal opinion, especially at least like while you're in college. Um, but then also I carry my OBQ in my, I have an OBQ because I think it's small, like it's nice to have it smaller. So especially for guys who like to not have to carry a purse, um, you can just put it in your pocket, but for girls, it slips right e easily into a purse of any size. So I always have it on me, um, as well as Benadryl and like an inhaler, but I just carry them in my backpack. Like I always have set in my backpack. I have a set in my purse. And then I try not to leave without the other. And if I am leaving with one, without either one of them, I have them in my coat, like in my coat pockets. Um, I like know that there's a bunch, like fanny packs are a trend again. They're back in style. So are maybe they? go for, yeah. I mean, I didn't know that. Yeah, I, oh. they are, they're trending. I don't have one, but you could, you could carry it in a fanny pack. And cool. I feel like no one would look twice. Um, so well, that's, that's what I do. Yeah. For me, um, I do what Allison does is, and I have a set. I have an inhaler and an EpiPen and like a little, a, a pack of Benadryl in my a backpack. I have it in my work bag and then I have it in like the purse that I just carry around. Um, and so that's what I do. And like, honestly, if you've ever had feelings where you're just like, oh, I like, I don't have my bag with me and I can't find my EpiPen. Do I really need it? It's I don't need to carry it. It's too bulky. All these things. Because trust me, we all have those. We all have those, you know, experiences and, and thoughts. Trust me, always have it. It's better safe than sorry. You know, we there are people out there with you who also have to carry an EpiPen. Do not be ashamed of the EpiPen. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I know from experience because freshman year, I had a really bad allergic reaction where my turkey burger that was supposed to be made in a separate pan, the pan wasn't clean. And my friends and I, I had my backpack on me. We all walked over to the school pool for our friend's swim meet. So this is like 20 minutes after eating. And I ended up with like a, hot, like a single hive on my chest. And that impending sense of doom was like on my shoulders. I was like, 
this is not good. And I went into my backpack and I found my Obicube, but I didn't have Benadryl, which for me is my first line of defense when I know I'm having a reaction. I'm um, like varies person to person, but in this situation, I did not have my Benadryl on me. And so now I'm like panicking. I'm at a crowded place, a bunch of my friends, and I look over to one of them and I go, I'm having allergic reaction. And they're like, what do we need to do? Like it's because I had told them right away, I have food allergies. They like knew that I had, like I needed help in that instance. Um, because I, I was like, look, I don't have a Benadryl. Is there anybody in our dorm? Because a bunch of us in the hall were all friends. So we called one of them and me and one of my friends left the pool and started walking like the half mile back to our dorm. And then my friend started running ahead of me and the other friend in the dorm started running to us. So I'm like walking and I'm panicking because now I'm wheezing and I can't hear anymore. My, my inner ear actually swelled up um, and I have more highs popping up, but my friends like sprinted to each other to get this Benadryl to me. Um, and then somebody else sprinted and brought me water so I could take the Benadryl. Like it, it was like a team process. Um, but it's because I made everyone really aware, like first day I have food allergies, um, that they were able to help me and they were able to be aware of the situation. Um, and I'll bring, I think Anna's laughing already because I actually have a food allergy song that I, my cousin wrote for me because I have so many, he thought it was funny to just like put him in a song and he still knows it. We wrote this like probably 10 years ago and <laughs> it was an easy way for my friends to run my food allergies. So when the EMS team arrived and I was mostly, I was stable for the most part, but I was still going to go to the hospital. Um, they asked, what are your food allergies? And my friend goes, Oh, I can tell you. And she said later, she sang the song in her head as she listed them out loud to this EM, EMS personnel. And I was like listening from like a few feet away. And I was like, she is getting everything correct. And it's because like, Again, I communicated with them. I educated them. It's about like getting yourself out there and comfortable with it. Because I remember my first day of college, like orientation, I'm ranting, I'm sorry. Um, and I can talk in a second. But, um, <laughs> no, you're fine. <laughs> my first day of college, I was like, you know what? I don't want to be the food allergy girl. So I'm probably not going to bring up my food allergies unless I need to. And I'll only bring it up with the people that I like live with or like be around all the time. And then I go to my first class and it's like our learning community. So I have two classes with these people all year and we're sharing fun facts about ourselves. And the person that goes right before me goes, I have six food allergies. And immediately I go, my fun fact is I have nine food allergies and I'm still friends with him, but it was just like a funny moment where I was like, I'm not going to do this. And then like literally 10 minutes later, I was like, well, I guess I did it. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's a great fun fact. It's it a, is a good fun it, fact. It's a good one. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, so we've got time for maybe like two more questions. And I feel the same way as this attendee who asked this question that, you know, just to say you are both such, you know, strong and empowered women. So I'll just say that. And then Thank you. the, you're welcome. The question to that is, have you ever felt like you know, always being different, although we're all different, you know, but having these food allergies, you know, has it taken an emotional toll? And that do you have any advice for others who maybe don't feel as empowered or, you know, don't feel, you know, as comfortable as being, you know, out there as maybe you two do? So for me, my, I, the school I went to, didn't I was the only girl with allergies like I think maybe someone else in the entire K through eight school had like a peanut allergy and there was like me with like all these allergies and I was always so self-conscious because I couldn't do the same things as other people did and everything everyone could do things so comfortably I would always be like why you can just like go and eat the sandwich without any thought and I'm here like I don't want to eat the sandwich I'm so different I'm sitting here with no food and a water and my own food and like you know no no kid wants to be different and so for me it's really been an empowerment thing I've had to really learn to be proud of my allergies over time um, when I went to high school I went to a decently small high school and so I was of course very out there everyone knew I had allergies 
Um, but through those experiences and through friends that I had, like I was able to be empowered and proud of who I was. And, you know, if you're feeling, you know, so alone in your allergies, you're feeling so like you're so different and, and it's so hard and I get it. I totally get it. And it's through these kind of things that we're doing right now. You know, I have, I met Allison in 2017 and av when I met Allison, I was like, oh my gosh, I don't have to explain why <laughs> we can't go out to eat literally. So when I, the first night I got to California, um, so it was myself and my mom and I had met Allison and Allison flew from the East coast over here. And I was in, we met and we were like, okay, yeah, let's go get dinner. And I go back to my hotel room and I'm like, I'm going to have to tell her that like, I don't want to go eat at some fancy place. <laughs> and I don't have to like, I don't want to go do that. Can we not tonight? Can we not? And so I'm like, wait, she has allergies too. I don't have to explain that. She's going to get it. And so of course she did. Cause she's amazing. And didn't we go to uh, in and out we got like, I think, oh, we did go to in and out and we also went I to got Subway. French fries we and she got Subway a burger. Tonight. Yes. We have great. Oh, that was so we did fun. Subway. We did Subway because there was that like big mall right next to the hotel in right, California. Right, right. Yeah, it was really fun. And so just experiences like that and, and going and meeting these people and, you know, tuning into these and you have us who have all these allergies and, and we live this life and we get you. We totally get you. And so it, it's through FAIR really that I've learned to be empowered and that I'm not alone in my struggles. So for me, I think the biggest thing I remember asking myself, like, why did God give me food allergies? And I was like really little. I would ask my mom that all the time. And she was like, oh, it's because he has something special planned for you. Like there's like there's a reason why you have food allergies. Um, and it's unfortunate. But th what really helped me to recognize that was everybody has something. So we have food mm -hmm. allergies. Other people might have heart conditions or they might have um, only one sibling. Like it could be anything where like they have diabetes our lot in life is just that we have food allergies and we're lucky enough that it is something that you can control for the most part. It is manageable, even though it is scary. Um, so I think just recognizing that, yes, sometimes you're called out in the lunchroom because you have a weird sandwich and everybody else has like pizza, um, that everybody has something going on in their life that's different, even if you don't know it. So it's just being aware like self-aware and aware of other people. Um, and I think that's really important to recognize. And then I also, I'm a very lighthearted person. So I take the jokes with a grain of salt and I mm -hmm. am totally like, okay with people knowing that I have food allergies and being able to like crack a joke about it because they know I have food allergies. Like they're still aware. And if there is a problem they they can like sober up and be serious about it. So it's not just, like they're not making fun of me. Like they are, like we're having, we're making fun of each other. So I'm gonna be insulting them about something else. So it's just like being able to be lighthearted about it because even if there is like a joke that you don't feel comfortable with, you can be like, hey, like that was a little bit too far. Um, but for the most part, it's something, that, it's a way you can bring awareness is like being able to joke about it and being able to talk to people about it. Mm -hmm. And and think about, you know, kind of how I said before, like just by being you and having these allergies and talking to people about allergies and, you know, ex quote unquote, exposing them to someone who's allergic to all these kind of things. And if they go and meet someone in the future and they're like, oh, I remember Anna and Allison, they were allergic to all kinds of things and, and they had to carry an EpiPen. And I, I remember them telling me I needed to be super careful. So this person, I'm going to make sure I'm super careful and I'm going to, I'm going to get it. I'm going to understand it for them and, and make, you know, their, their life a little bit easier in that time. And so think about like, you know, you could save an allergic reaction just by, you know, educating people. And, you know, for me, I've, uh, you know, felt empowered by the, the work that I've done through my honors thesis. Like I've been able to go out and, and talk to people about how to use an EpiPen and, and, and educate people. So then kids in schools, you know, might be saved from an allergic reaction or someone will know how to use an EpiPen in case they have a reaction. And it's through those allergies. And really, I wouldn't, I don't think I'd be as passionate about allergies if I didn't have them myself. So, you know, it's really a great, it's a great feeling to know you can do good through your own struggles. Because your advocacy to somebody, like informing somebody about your food allergies could save somebody else if that person ends up being around them. And even if like, so if you're standing up for yourself, there might be somebody that's afraid to stand up for themselves. So by you advocating for your food allergies, whether it's with 
friends and individuals or to your college campus, I've had people come up to me and be like, hey, thanks for all the work that you do to make mm -hmm. our student cafeteria safer. Because there's been like one or two posts about how I've done stuff about it. Um, and people come up to you and say thank you because they weren't able to do it themselves or they were too afraid to. So sometimes it's fighting for the greater good, you could say, um, and doing what you can with what you have in life. Mm -hmm. Start a chain reaction. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you both. So we are, we've got time for just one more quick question. And, um, and I kind of know, like, you guys have been talking about it throughout the presentation, just maybe, like, the main thing you would recommend is communication. And, you know, this person did ask, like, what is that one thing you could recommend to every, you know, food allergy freshman as they're entering into college? And, and feel free to expand on, on that. But I was also wondering, just because I think we have a lot of parents um, in the audience today, is there, like, one My mom's recommendation here. <laughs> for them? Oh, hey. <laughs> is there one thing? recommend to a parent as maybe they're helping their child prepare or just like you know advice to give or any any thoughts on that as we close out for the day I think that the biggest thing to tell parents is that it's okay to step back mm -hmm. because in the same way that like a kid without food allergies going out to college and like learning how to live by themselves you need to let them do that too with food allergies even though it's slightly a higher risk um, if you don't let them speak up for themselves when they're off at college, like you're not going to be around them forever. I'm sorry to say, I know mom, I love you. Um, <laughs> but like you need to be able to stand up for yourself as a teen, as a young adult. Um, like I, like my parents have been letting me speak about my food allergies, going out to restaurants by myself for forever. Um, but it's funny because even now, like I'm, almost 22 and my, I'll go home. My dad will be like, okay, so she has food allergies. And I'm like, Oh, I guess dad's going to explain today because it's instinct to take care of your kid. But there reaches a point where you're going to have to let them learn from their mistakes. There are going to be times where they make mistakes and ingest the wrong food. And hopefully it's not a life threatening situation, but it's something that they learn from in the same way that like you learn from other mistakes you make in college and make on your own. Um, and I think that as the advice for a freshman is be bold, like don't back down and fight for yourself because if you don't, no one else will, like you have to stand up for yourself with your friends, with the dining offices, like with the individual employee who's making your lunch that day. If you see them messing up, and it's, it's awkward and it's un frustrating, especially if you're tired and you're hungry and you just want your food and you've already been waiting so long. If you see them mess up, you don't have to sit back and then just like take the plate and not eat anything. Like say, hey, you didn't change your gloves. I mm -hmm. like, I really need you to change your gloves. And then they'll start over. Like I've had multiple people start to make me a sandwich and I watch them cut the knife at the very last step, cut the bread at the very last step with the wrong knife. And I'm like, look, I can't eat that sandwich. You're going to have to start again. And it might be awkward and they might be resentful towards you because not everybody, because they might be having a bad day. You don't know exactly what's going on. Um, mm -hmm. But if you don't stand up for yourself, no one else will. So for parents, it's stepping back. And for kids, standing up. Mm -hmm. I would say teens, young adults. <laughs> yes yes um, for me my mom did an amazing job of making sure I didn't miss out on opportunities because I had allergies and didn't let me back down to people who didn't want to you know help me with my allergies and so I kind of like Allison I have been advocating for my allergies for a very long time and that really helped me. I'm really glad my parents kind of were able to kind of push me out there and, and let me have those opportunities and let me go out and, and be with friends. Because if I didn't, then I wouldn't have learned to be so confident with my allergies. Because it's through those experiences that you become confident. And kind of like Allison said, like if you are at Subway or you're at some place that, you know, are make, is making your sandwich and the person doesn't cut the sandwich with the right knife, or doesn't change their gloves. And, you know, sometimes they're gonna act like, you know, they're ha like if they're having a bad day, they're not gonna respond well and they, they might be frustrated, but it's really, you have to advocate for yourself because it's your life on the line. And that's very important. Your safety is never less important 
than someone else's inconvenience. Yes. Oh, good one. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Thank you both so much. Um, this has been amazing. Um, Anna, can you turn to the next slide for me? I just yeah. want to uh, show everybody some of the resources that we have at FAIR. We have a ton of college resources. You know, in addition to everything that they spoke about today, you can kind of find some of this on our website. We have a college search tool. We have information on maybe like questions that you'd want to ask a prospective college or university, information on how to stay safe in your dorm room, maybe how you could find a college support group. So I just recommend everyone, you know, to check out our website and our resources. And then also on the next slide, you'll see that um, FAIR does have a patient registry. Um, we're really, you know, seeking to build this registry, you know, in the diversity of all of the Americans with food allergies. Um, and teens and young adults, um, their voices really need to be heard. So you can super easily and confidentially, you know, share your food allergy story with researchers by joining this patient registry. Um, the URL is foodallergypatientregistry.org. Um, any food allergy patient under 18 will need parental consent to sign up. But, you know, just like Allison and Anna, every, you know, patient story is unique. And the more who can join and contribute to this registry, I mean, the better that data is going to be for researchers as we move forward with developing um, new treatments and as we improve patient care across the board. So thank you. And please kind of look into that. I encourage you to sign up. And then lastly... On the next slide, I want to give a huge thank you to our presenters today. They are such impressive young women, and I know they, you know, really helped a lot of you as you start this journey, um, you know, with your own families and heading off to college and then, you know, adulting, as Anna said, in the real <laughs> world. So um, thank you both so much for, for your candor again and, and sharing with us your stories and experience. Like they said, they met at a – a FAIR conference, I think back in 2017. So if you mm -hmm. didn't know, FAIR has national um, educational conferences. We have one coming up in 2020. It's going to be in Orlando um, in October. And you can kind of check out information at that on foodallergy.org slash FAIR summit. And it is a great opportunity, you know, for teens to meet other teens with food allergies and connect and build, and build those friendships that, you know, will probably last a lifetime, you know, as we've seen here Absolutely. today. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. A huge thank you, thank you to you guys. We appreciate it. Yes, of course. Yeah, thank you for organizing this. It was great to get ourselves out there and help people out a little bit today. Yeah. Wonderful. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye. Bye. All right. Bye, everyone.